Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the great Teddy Atlas. We're here for part two of our mythical matchup series. And in part one, we just Teddy discussed his introduction to Mike Tyson and his early journey in working with Mike and uh, with Cuss as well, with kind of Teddy being caught in the middle of Tyson starting to recognize that Cuss was his advocate or almost like a grandparent where Mike was basically starting to get away with bad behavior and Teddy was forced into a position of almost being like the teacher or the dad and trying to be the disciplinarian and Mike kind of playing both sides of the fence. So when we left off, Teddy, you guys had just started going to the smokers. I think you had traveled to a um, tournament in Colorado. Mike's about 13 years old. Looks like he's 20. He's about 195 pounds and... um, Maybe you could pick it up from there. So you just start. He's starting to have problems in school. Cuss is starting to make excuses for him. I thought we got past him. all that. That's uh, where that's where we left off. So uh, now, at what point you guys start? I think it was in eighty one and eighty two. We went to the Junior Olympics. And yeah, we, we had two Junior National Junior Olympics in Colorado Springs. Knocked everybody out. Mm-hmm. Both years. Um. I think in the last one, did someone did the corner throw in the towel for? Um, I think we knocked. Yeah, we. I think we knocked everyone out in the second one, uh, or in the first round. You know, I, I thought we had talked about this before, but it it got to the point where you know we're, there's fourteen, fifteen year old kids, and they look like fourteen, fifteen year old kids, and they have acne and they all this stuff and. Um, you know, here's Tyson, 190 pounds, solid, and you know the rumors went around that it was Sonny Liston's nephew. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought we did this already. Yeah, I just want to yeah. pick up so we give some yeah. context to where we are. So, I, I think that for me, unless you, you you direct me somewhere else, for me, I, I thought we got pretty much to the end of the purpose to talk about Tyson so much, and you guys uh, are very good at keeping me in the right direction and uh, making sure we do it the right way that and caring about me and caring about the show that and that's why I'm doing it with you guys otherwise I wouldn't do it with you guys is that you you wanted being that we're going to do mythical matchups I think we picked about seven of them and they're good they're, they're very interesting ones I think you people are going to enjoy them they really are and look it's my opinion and but I give both sides to the story to break it down to give you know arguments on both sides and the backdrops of what was going on and what their talents were and what you might have thought they were versus what they they weren't and all of that and it's some of the biggest names in boxing some of the best styles some of the greatest talents some of the greatest personalities, some of the greatest moments, some of the greatest f- actions, some of the greatest historic uh, connections. And we try to, I mean, it was years ago when they tried to do a computer fight with Marciano and Ali that, you know, I, I, it didn't feel, how could it be authentic? It's it's not flesh and blood fighting, it's, it's film. But, and then at the end, I think they had Marciano winning over Ali. Uh, but I I wanted to pick ones that really, really would speak to the people, to the imagination of the people, what they would be looking for, what they would enjoy, what just all the different virtues of these great fighters that could come to life, that never got a chance to come to life. You know, if you could have put them together and if you could have went back in time and, and transported them back where they were all in the same arena and you could get them together. You know, so I do the best I can with that and I hope that people will enjoy it. And the reason we're doing this section to prelude that is because of the, again, the honesty of you guys and you being that I think three of the first seven mythical matchups that I picked involved Tyson because he was a he's a mythical figure just about mm-hmm. and <clears throat> it made sense and you guys wanted to explain and have me explain to the audience before we get into especially the Tyson ones that and all of them eventually collectively that 
there's not sour grapes if I he's not going to win them all. He, he you know he will win some. I mean uh, because he would have and some he wouldn't have. And again, it's it's my opinion. Yes, I get it. But we just you guys were good enough to tell me let them understand it's not tainted. And I would hope I have a good enough reputation by this point in my career in this business that you would be able to trust that because it's not tainted. It's I'm human, you know. Do I have my likes and dislikes? Yeah. Do I have my grudges? Yeah. But when it comes to professionally putting out my thoughts and my opinion, I was always of the thought that you got to live with that and it means more than how you feel about something. It means more than your anger. It means more than your, you know, your emotions. It's, it's part of your legacy. I've said this before. It's part of your children's legacy. It's part of the truth. That's more important than anything else. It means something. It means everything to me. I mean, there's people that don't hire me now uh, on television because of that. I mean, if you're going to get down to it, it's no secret some of those promoters out there that, and some of them have said to my face, they love me and all this stuff, you know, but some of them have said to behind my face, they hate me, but um, it's all the same. I mean, you know, it is what it is, but they don't hire me because even though they may feel they have a relationship with me that I like them or they like me. When it comes down to this, to doing my job, to doing my business, it's going to last longer than them. They're going to be dead when this is still alive. That means something to me. Do you understand yeah. that? Oh, it means well. something to me. To my, well. and, and that I ask my children to try to abide, I'm not perfect, but to abide by that understanding. So that's why... I, I'm not working in certain places where they say, and they have said, we want to hire Teddy, or the fans are good enough to say, uh, wouldn't mind hearing Teddy maybe. And the fans don't mind it because it it's something that is easier for them to get the truth because they're not on, they don't have a horse in a the race. They, right. You know, fans can have a horse in a race. But I mean, on the whole, they, they're watching a match, they want to know what's going on. If, if it's a bad match, they... I think they like to know. Yeah, you know, you want to you want to know if the weather's bad so you can get an umbrella, or maybe you decide not to go out that day. Maybe you decide not to make that day the day that you're going to go out with your wife and kids to the park and do a picnic. Maybe you make another choice because you knew what the weather was going to be. Well, maybe if somebody told them that's not going to be a good fight, they won't watch it that night. Promoter, that's why I'm not there sometimes. Oh, and they say nice things about me, but at the end of the day, I know behind the doors with the executives, they say no. The fans might like them, but we we don't need them. And but what I do need, and what does need me, is my children to know that I told the truth. That's all. Yeah. And so I'm using this, and you're asking me to to explain to the people that whether I pick Tyson to win or lose, it's based on what I know. <clears throat> if I know about his weaknesses, should should I not say them? I, I just happen to be in a situation which I spent that time talking about before, about his background and me training him as an amateur to just go over that, that I know things that the average person would know about him. So let's just say that I knew about a house that, you know, that the, well, say the house, I knew that the house looked like a beautiful house. And it had a lot of virtues to it. It had a lot of good things to it, you know. But once you get past the outside beauty of the house and some of what's awesome about the house and how big it is and majestic it is, once you got past that, I knew, I happen to know because I lived in the house, like I live with Tyson, I happen to know that if you put three TV sets on at the same time, the electricity goes on and off. 
that, that, that it flutters. I happen to know that if you take a bath and a shower at the same time, that you can't use the sink downstairs. Right? Does that, I happen to know, you know, that if uh, you have more than 10 people in the living room, the floor feels like it's moving a little bit. Am I not supposed to say that I know that to the house when, when maybe there's somebody that's going to put that house up as, as a cultural landmark when it's not, it's a nice house, don't get me wrong, but it's not St. Patrick's Cathedral, it's not Gracie Mansion. So if somebody's going to sell it as such, am I wrong to say, if I have that knowledge, to say, well, it's, I still appreciate that it has majestic views. I still appreciate it has a five-car garage. Tyson had a five-car garage. I still appreciate, you know, uh, that it had, it had granite uh, floors, if there is such a thing as granite floors, marble floors, and chandeliers. I, it had all that. I appreciate all of that, all of it. But am I supposed to not? I use art. If I'm a lover of art, and and somebody really is a good artist, but he's he's not that level. If I'm an art supposedly expert, and they're gonna hang it with Rembrandts and Picassos, am I supposed to not say if I'm a appreciator of art, a respecter of art, a respect of these other fighters, and I'm supposed to not say it shouldn't hang? with Rembrandt. It shouldn't hang with Picasso. It shouldn't be in that museum. And maybe there's sometimes I might say that Tyson shouldn't hang with Lewis. He shouldn't hang with Ali. Doesn't mean that I don't think Tyson was tremendous. Just because I'm saying maybe he shouldn't hang with those particular special guys. Because I know something that maybe you don't know. That's all. I understand that. So I shouldn't I, I shouldn't be able to say that and give that information. And at the same time, I'll be the first one to tell you, take the cotton out of ears. I get ready. Mickey Mantle just want to use a universal name. Maybe the greatest switch hitter of all time in baseball, a sport that's been around almost as long as boxing, a sport that was called the pastime of America. A great sport. Well, Mickey Mantle, the greatest switch hitter for power and average from the left side or the right side of the plate. Mike Tyson was Mickey Mantle to me in a way that he could punch from the left side or the right side with either hand. You had other great fighters, great punchers, that whether it was Max Schmel or uh, Max Babb with the thunder of his right hand, you know, that could club you like like a like a pole uh heavyweight champ max bear he had that right hand or ernie shavers with the tremendous you know pulverizing right hand that could knock a wall down you know or um deontay wilder who's around today with a right hand that could paralyze you or joe fraser's left hook that could pulverize you whatever whatever it was these guys could punch on one side of the plate. They couldn't do what Tyson did. Tyson, that's how good he was. I'm giving you that. That's what we're doing here. I'm explaining to you. Yeah, he could, he could punch the way Mickey Mantle could deliver home runs from the left to the right. He could do that, not too many. And then to mix that with the incredible, extraordinary, almost unheard of, speed to go as a heavyweight with that in quickness almost like visualizing a Manny Pacquiao a large Manny a larger Manny Pacquiao a heavyweight Manny Pacquiao with tremendous speed and power it's it's you don't see it much that's how good Tyson is that's how good he was that's how special he was he was a meteorite that went across the sky but he wasn't a planet Ali, Lewis, these guys, Marciano, you want to put him in there. There's, there's, there's other ones. They, 
their planets. They had more substance in certain areas. They didn't just go across and be gone. They stayed. They overcame. Tyson, his weakness, and I know you want me to get to this, his weakness can, he couldn't overcome. See, for me, I've said it before, a fight is not a fight until there's something to overcome. I don't give a freak what Webster's Dictionary does. I live in boxing. I know what a fight is. A fight is when you have to deal with something. Resistance. That's a fight. That's when Tyson disappeared. Why? You want me to give you explanations for it? Well, one of it was he had the curse of being such a great puncher that he wasn't forced to have to always develop that strength because he could erase things in a moment. Bang! Gone. Problem solved. Problem solved. Don't have to overcome. <laughs> don't have to overcome. That's don't have to get point. in the trenches. Don't don't have to roll my sleeves up. Tuck up those pants. Get muddy. No. Didn't have to do that. But also part of it was what's part of all of us. What we are. Character. What's inside. What is truly our strength. What's not just outside. You know. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And as a fighter, when the devil knocked on the door to ask you to lay down your arms, to spit out your beliefs, to give up on what you said you wouldn't give up on, to walk away from what you said you wouldn't walk away from. To submit. To quit. To say no. To be gone. To vacate. When the devil knocked on the door, fighters like Holyfield bolted the freaking door. I'm using Holyfield now. Ali, Joe Lewis, they bolted the door. Tyson opened it. I understand that. So I'm not supposed to. He allowed the door to open. Well, his weakness is partly because if you live a certain way and, you, and you're weak in certain ways and then you have to be strong at a moment and you have to feel like you're really that guy. I've said it before. You have to feel like you're that Viking, that gladiator, that warrior, that samurai. When you have to really feel like you're that guy that can walk through like a fireman goes into a burning building and goes into that mission. When you have to feel that you're that guy with, and yet you feel like you're a guy that's done a lot of unholy things maybe sometimes, weak things, bad things, and you know you've done them. I mean, you, what's that old saying? You can hide from everyone else, but you can't hide from yourself. Yep. You know, it, it, that comes to the door. I'm just saying when he came to the, when you look at his record, whether it was Holyfield, whether it was Buster Douglas, you say, oh, he, you know, the Buster Douglas, he didn't train. He was in pretty damn good shape in that fight. Say whatever you want. He was going to Japan. He was, he was doing the Don King years and blamed Don King and he wasn't training and it was girls and it was this and that. No, he hit him with his best punch. He got up and then there was nothing left. And uh, Douglas stood up to him. And then the other guys, McBride, Kevin McBride, you know, really, I mean, just a, yeah. a, that, that he spit the bit on. The, Joe Lewis didn't lose those guys. They had bad nights. They were flawed in certain ways, but not in those ways. Mm. Ali didn't lose those guys. Marciano didn't lose anyone. But, uh, you know, they they didn't lose. Holyfield didn't lose those guys. Uh, and go on and on. So what I'm saying is that I know about his strengths. I just embraced them. I just talked about them. I just celebrated them. I understand them. I applaud them. I I I I say yeah. Uh, it's special. What more can I say? But I can't ignore his weaknesses. And those weaknesses in our mythical matchups will be some of the reasons why he might come up short. In some of these fights. It won't be because of his physical abilities. It'll be because of the things that I just touched on. 
that I just talked about. Because when the knock on the door came, he didn't answer. When that knock came to these other guys, they answered. They knew what the answer had to be. No submission on my watch. There was submission on Tyson's watch. No matter how you draw it up, when, when he bit Holyfield's ear, do you really think he was hungry? Do you really think it was a street thing? Are you really that dumb? Are you? Really? Or was it just a way to get the freak out? Yeah, short of taking a knee and just saying no more. That Can you be- ever imagine Tyson doing what Holyfield did? Holyfield, with his ear missing... And the referee Mills Lane, the great Mills Lane, telling him, "I'm gonna disqual, I'm gonna disqualify the guy. I'm gonna end this fight. You won. I'm just." Disqual- and his trainer, I think, it was Tommy Brooks at the time. Uh, good guy, good boxing guy, good trainer. Uh, Lou Duva, the great Lou Duva. I love him. I miss him. Uh, his son-in-law. When he was the trainer, when they went up to, I, be- I believe he was there. And I don't know if Don Turner was there at the time. But they went up to the train of Holyfield. Like I said, the referee said to him, I'm going to disqualify this guy. You won the fight. You don't got to go on anymore. The trainer says, you're getting disqualified. We're, we're, we're freak this. We're out of here. Holyfield said, the hell are you talking about? Put my mouthpiece back in my mouth so I can go and knock this guy out. That's all I'm talking about. Tyson doesn't make him a bad guy. It doesn't make him less than a, one of the greatest punchers ever and the greatest finishers ever and the greatest combinations of speed and power ever. It doesn't make him less than that. It just doesn't make him the other thing. That's all. And again, because I happen to have this information and know this, I should ignore it. I know fans. What's, what is fans short for? Fanatic? I get it. I know you're crazy. <laughs> I'm crazy too. <laughs> but, but in my business, in this business, I can't be crazy. Because I explained to you why. It's my responsibility to try to be better than that. Try not to be. When you're a fan, you don't have to be. You could just be... It's all right. It's good to be... It's good, it's good to be that sometimes. It is. It's fun. It is. It's fun. For being a fan is fun. But sometimes you got to come down a little bit from the heavens. And you have to, you know, say, hey, maybe maybe this guy isn't quite what I want him to be all the time. And that's what I'm saying, you know. Uh when you were working with him in these early days, what was his work ethic like? And, and were there moments where your, where your relationship with him was like friendly? Because we talked a lot about your relationship with Michael Moore and how it could no, be. No, we talked about this already, Ken. I mean, I was, I mean, I was his trainer. I was, he was a kid. I was, uh, and we were cl- uh, close. We had a good, I mean, we were close. I, I trained him for almost four years. I mean, I, I was his trainer. I, I was his, you know, guy that uh, told him what he was doing right and wrong and it, it just I really do feel like we talked about this already but we it, it just disintegrated in a way where Cus you know I became the bad cop Cus yeah. became the good cop you know Cus was a great man uh, but how would I have behaved if I was in my 70s instead of my 20s Yeah, and and my whole life had been built around the only thing that mattered was having champions. Yeah. And time was running out on having one more champion. One more champion. One mm-hmm. more champion. One more champion. Uh, how would I have behaved? I don't know. Yeah, I fair. hope I hope I would know. I hope I would know. And um but until you're there, until that moment comes, so that devil knocks on the door. You're never completely sure as much as you want to believe you are, you know. And uh, I, I mean, 
I, Tyson, you know, I, I mean, he, he cried on my shoulders, you know, before his first national uh, junior Olympic championship because I was the guy that he could cry on his shoulder. I, I was his guide. I was his teacher, his, his friend. I wasn't going to say, what are you crying for? What are you, a fool? Stop making my shirt wet. Mm. No, I was going to put my hand around his, you know, around his back and say and tell him what it, what I needed to tell him that everything's going to be good, everything's going to be all right. You know, so when you ask me, "Will we friendly?" It's almost insulting to hear you ask me that, and I know you don't mean it that way, but I, I'm a pretty direct guy. Yeah, and um. It, how could we have gotten to the places we got to if it wasn't friendly? But what is friendly? There's there's a quandary. What is friendly? When your responsibility is to be a mentor, to be a teacher, to be a guide, you know, a trainer, a parent, to a certain a surrogate parent, what is friendly? What is friendly? Go yeah. eat all the ice cream you want. You know, you do something wrong. That's okay. That was their fault. That friendly? In a lot of people's eyes, you know, maybe, yeah, I guess. But to me, no, that's not friendly. That's enemy. Mm -hmm. That's enemy. Because there'll be consequences for that allowance. Friendly means friends, means care, means like. You brought it up. Um means you, it matters. So if it matters what his future is, if it matters about this kid, how he feels and the positions he's going to be, then I have to make sure part of friendly is telling him, caring about him as a friend, what he needs to hear to keep him out of trouble, to keep him... Uh, from getting to places that will be detrimental, that will be hurtful, that a friend would want to see somebody in. Yeah, I guess the, that was guess, my job. I guess to clarify, I'm thinking of Michael Mora telling you he's not going to run, and you coming down and telling him you are running. If it was kind of like butting heads, or there if were it times was even with Michael <clears throat> Mora, we were friendly. I love Michael Mora. We were we were friendly. But you know well, what I mean? Were, no, friendly but, but, might not be the best no, no, word, but I, there was I like get that. it. But there were the times we were confrontational. Yeah. Yes. Because that's going to happen. When have you seen a parent that hasn't had an argument with their kid where, you know, the, you can't have the ice cream that day. You can't watch TV that day. You can't go out that day. You can't talk to your girlfriend that day. That's a tough one. <laughs> And it gets older too, you know. You can't use the car. Yeah. You 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 lost that right. You won't, you didn't do the right thing. You were responsible. Whatever. Unfortunately, I became more of that guy a little bit too. But it was still, in my mind, friendly. Yeah. You know, I became more of that guy because Cuz had the burden of wanting that last pull at the the ring. You know. And and he was this is a great man, but his whole life, that's 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 what his whole life was. You know, he once told me I didn't marry any woman because it wouldn't have been fair. How many people could have say that to you? It wouldn't have been right because I was already married. I said married, yeah, boxing. He said I I how could I give more to anyone else than I was given to this? He says how could I go and ask a person to Spend a life with me when I knew that I was going to give more to this than to them. That's a hell of a statement. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. I never heard that story before. Yeah. What, so, year, what year did you leave there? Were you there in 84? Was it in 84 when he lost to go to the Olympics? Um, no, I was gone already. Okay. But, you know, he, um, he lost to Tillman. 
That's what you're talking Twice, about. Twice, right? Yeah. I mean, because he wasn't a, because the amateurs were, there's two reasons why he lost. One was the amateurs, the style, the, the whole setup of the scoring was supposed to be based on boxing, not power. Right. That's why guys that might have been good amateurs didn't necessarily mean that they were going to be good pros. Mm-hmm. Tyson, even if he wasn't a top amateur, and he was, but he didn't win the Olympics. Uh, he didn't get to the Olympics. But he was going to be a better pro than Tillman because he had the qualification to be a better pro. you know. But as the amateurs went, you know, a jab counted as much as a knockdown. Yeah. So... He knocked down Tillman, if my memory serves me correctly, in both. He fought Tillman twice. Yep. He knocked him down both times and lost both times mm-hmm. because of the amateur rules that we just explained. Yep. You know, Warren towards power um, and politics, I'm sure, a little bit. I don't know that they really wanted. I, I think they were a little nervous about uh, Tyson at that time even representing the United States uh, in that way more than uh, Tillman, I think they were more comfortable maybe with Tillman, uh, maybe even with the control Tyson or the control Cuss was already projecting uh, to that I'm going to have more say than you're normally used to uh, having somebody have with one of the guys representing your team. Yeah. You know? Yep. Well, that's the reason I was asking is I was just curious if there was anything – that you saw or, or that anyone anything that was picked up from okay now he's had some setbacks let's see how he reacts from that but um that's fine we can move on from that but let's talk about some of these mythical matchups and how you think let's he might, get to it baby how you think he might match up against some of the uh the all-time greats in the uh should we put up division. it's up to you guys because we didn't rehearse this should we put up what the list will be of mythical matchups down the road, what I'm planning on doing, because I th- I thought I picked some. I hope you guys agree. I think that we picked some good ones. Yeah, and yeah. I like you to kind of like you choose your movie that you're going to go to. I like to let you know what's playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the Tyson, for this Tyson um, episode, we're going to have him, we're going to do an, ana- have you do an analysis on uh, Tyson versus Foreman. Tyson versus Joe Frazier and Tyson versus Sonny Liston, all of course when they're in there when they're young and in their primes. Um, and then I think some of the other ones. Do you have them? Just just for the future yeah, ones, of because we're going to we just have them do up them. here on the screen. Yeah. Then we're going to have Roberto Duran against Floyd Mayweather in their primes, and then uh, a lightweight Roberto Duran versus Aaron Pryor when he was undefeated. And then we'll get into a prime middleweight champ, Marvin Hagler, versus an undefeated middleweight champ, Roy Jones. That's an interesting one. Yeah. And then uh, the Manasseh Mala, Jack Dempsey versus Joe Frazier. I, I like them. I yeah. Mean, oh, yes. Yeah. I'm being a little prejudiced. <laughs> but I hope you guys like them. That's more important. And and I want to just tell you, and then you'll take me right into it. Yeah. yeah a lot of you are going to say different eras, different times, different sizes, football players against the football players today, against the football players in the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, whatever. The athletes are bigger today. They're stronger. They're, yep, no argument. But so how are you going to take guys that were so big, behemoths, fighting guys back in the day that some of these guys were around heavyweights were 185 pounds. Marciano was 185 pounds. Yeah. Joe Lewis was 204, you know. Uh, still big, but not as big as the guys today, of course. So how do you do that? We do it. Because what I do is, if a guy has a natural, I bring it together and I use as my criterion to come up with the winner, the best man, the last man standing. I use... Their physical abilities, their physical attributes, their speed, their power, their elusiveness, their technique, their cleverness, their instincts, their timing, all these things, all those things. And then go into what we touched on with Tyson, their mental powers, strengths, weaknesses, their character, you know, what they've shown in other fights so that you can get an assessment of such things. And you go over all the the quality of opponents, who they fought, everything. 
what they've shown you they can do, how far up the mountain they can climb, what their endurance is, mental and physical, what they can deal with. All those things, I assess all that, put, throw that all into the pot. And then as far as size, well, I bring it, I bring it all together where I say, if a guy from a, years ago from a different era is fighting a guy from a later era where the guys are naturally bigger, well, that guy would have been bigger too. So I'm not playing God, <laughs> but I grow them. I just grow them naturally. How would they have grown? They would have got naturally bigger too. Now, if they still would be naturally smaller, then they'd be bigger than they were, but they'd still be the smaller guy. Yep. Just like Ruiz was a smaller guy with Joshua. Yep. You know, just like they're still bigger guy, but they're still a bigger, smaller guy. Holyfield was the smaller guy. He went up from cruiserweight. He fought bigger guys. He was still the small, but I just, I just figure we we figure it out that a guy from another era moving into this era would still have the same abilities, disadvantages, advantages that he had in that era. They're still going to show themselves in that era for what they were. And as again, as far as the side, it's all comparable. It's uh, if the other guy was still going to be a bigger guy, he'd still be bigger. He'd still be the naturally bigger guy, but it it won't be maybe quite as dramatic as it would have been if you didn't make those adjustments. So we make adjustments in those kind of ways, calculations, mm -hmm. if you will, in those kind of ways, and we come up with I think some some fights that we really do wish we could have seen. Yeah. So let's go. So first up, we got Tyson, George Foreman. Wow. Um, you ain't going to like this, Tyson fans. <laughs> <laughs> the f first one, you had to pick that one, get, get me in trouble. <laughs> All right. It, Foreman learned from the original Intimidator. The first foreman, before the second foreman came along. Not the cheeseburger loving foreman, but the sultry foreman, the, the, the foreman that intimidated you, the foreman that melted you with his stare. It is interesting how power. he had two different personalities. Oh, yes. I mean, yes. literally, one was Smart intimidating, man. aggressive, like Smart he's a scary man. dude. Smart the second man. one, you want to have him over for a cookout. He's like yeah. just lovable, yeah. chubby. And he could even bring his own um, grill. Yeah. For the cookout. Yeah. Well, that's pretty special. How many guys can you invite <laughs> over for a cookout and they bring the grill? I mean, he could bring it. So the first, either one, first or second foreman, first of all, remember George Foreman against Joe Frazier, the way he picked Frazier up off the floor. The matchup was bad. I don't know what that sound is. Somebody's phone's clicking. But the matchup was bad. The, the style was bad. Styles make fights. And in that fight, Frazier and Foreman, Frazier was, Foreman was too big for him, but he had the wrong punches or the right punches for Frazier, the, the uppercut. Uh, Frazier coming in low, the uppercut picking him up, uh, destroying him. Uh, the jab, Foreman had a hard jab that could pulverize you, uh, that could keep you where he wanted to keep you, could stun you. Um, it was like a foam pole. And Foreman, I started to say, Foreman and Tyson both learned their intimidation skills from the same guy, the original intimidator, Sonny Liston. Mm. Such a better fighter than people realize because of all the mess in his life. They don't realize how good a fighter this guy was. And I don't know if the fight with Ali was fixed. I digress, <laughs> but I don't, uh, forgive me, but uh, the first fight, I don't know, first, second, if it was fixed because of the people that Liston was involved in. We we'll never really know. Ali was great. We do know that. But let me tell you something. So was Liston. I know people might be surprised to hear that. Liston was a hell, he was, he was a great fighter. 
And unfortunately, he won't get full credit for that, but he'll get it here. So he was the original intimidator. He destroyed people when he looked at them. The way that Tyson destroyed people when he looked at them. The way Foreman destroyed people when he looked at them. Well, Lester was the original intimidator. Well, the guy right behind him was Foreman. Foreman picked it up, and Foreman was ahead of Tyson in that department. And again, Foreman's style was wrong for Tyson. Tyson would have came in trying to slip and bob, and Foreman would have, I think it would have been a replay of the fight with Foreman and Frazier that we already know what happened mm -hmm. in that. Twice, Foreman knocked him out. Bad style. Uh, had the right punches to catch him. The, the, the size advantage. He would have had the size advantage, and they are from the same era, so we don't even have to play that game, you know, to to make uh, to make to conform things and to adjust things. We don't even have to do that. The foreman was naturally the bigger guy. He would have been able to catch Tyson coming in, time him coming in. Foreman had a great chin. Tyson would have landed maybe a left hook. Against Foreman, I could see that, the left hook landing. Uh, Foreman could have handled it. Foreman had a great chin. He had a, the funny thing is the older Foreman, the second Foreman, the cheeseburger loving Foreman, probably even had a greater chin in some ways because he, he mentally was stronger. He didn't depend just on intimidation and power. He understood experience. He understood things that he didn't understand in the first coming of George. He understood him in the second coming. He learned that lesson 10 years earlier from somebody named Muhammad Ali who mm. broke him down in a place called Zaire. Mm. So, and he was stronger the second time. He wasn't any stronger physically, but stronger where it counted, yeah. mentally. So for that first fight, that first mythical matchup, I'm going to say, you know, as much as the Tyson fans uh, are not going to want to really hear this, I'm going to say that Foreman... Foreman knocks out Tyson. That again, very close to the Frazier, you know, situation. Uh, bad style, bad everything, bad matchup, bad um, psychologically going into, you know, going up there where one of your things that you use against other guys, the ability to intimidate, it's going to be like uh, putting a mirror up uh, to Dracula. You know, yeah. it, it, it ain't, it ain't, you ain't going to see nothing. You ain't going to see no reflection. When you think about the intimidation factor and, and, and um, Foreman and, and uh, Sonny Liston were a little ahead of me, ahead of my time, but I remember distinctly Mike Tyson intimidating people coming into the ring. When you look back at all of those, who do you think on a whole was more intimidating to their opponents coming into the ring based on the results that followed? Foreman or Tyson? Yeah. I would say Tyson maybe. Uh, I'll give you that because... It was maybe doing a, might have been doing a weaker era. The guys were a little weaker, a little bit more prone to being intimidated. The the people that were around during Tyson's reign versus the people that maybe were a little tougher. You know, Foreman had to fight guys like Ron Lyle, who had done, done time in, penitent, in the penitentiary seven years or whatever. Not that that's what makes him tough, but Lyle was a good puncher, pretty good fighter. That was the elevator fight where both guys were up and down in that fight, mm. Lyle and Foreman. People probably, a lot of people forget about that fight. That was a hell of a heavyweight fight, you know. I'll tell you, uh, there was some heavyweight fights people shouldn't forget about. You guys want to Google stuff, go and find that 15th round. They don't go 15 rounds anymore. Go and find that 15th round with Kenny Norton and and Larry Holmes, and see how somebody's life can be changed with one round. One round changed that, the life of both guys. Great round, great round. But that Lyle Foreman fight was a hell of a fight. You know, both guys being dropped, both guys getting off the floor. Foreman, of course, winning that fight. Um, but there was, I think there were harder guys, a little harder to intimidate to in Foreman's time. And Tyson's guys were a little... A little easier, a little bit more vulnerable in those areas. Not as strong, not as tough. So Tyson was able to get further with the intimidation employees. But again, 
And he was very effective with that. He destroyed people with that. In the amateurs, too, there were people, mm -hmm. when I had them, they, they pulled out of the amateur tournament if they heard Tyson was in it. I mean, where do you hear about that? Not too often. The only place I ever heard about that other than that was Mark Breland, who was one of the greatest amateurs of all time uh, in New York, won the gold gloves about six times, knocking everyone out, and he won a gold medal in the Olympics, too. And Mark Breland, he... When he would be in the tournament in New York Gold Gloves, sometimes somebody would pull out or they go into a different weight class. Say, you know what? I think I'm going to get fatter this week. <laughs> <laughs> and usually people don't say that, you know? Yeah. I'm usually not going to get fatter, but I'm probably going to get fatter. So anyway, that's how I see that fight. Uh, I think it would have been a little similar to the Frazier Foreman fight uh, because of what I just said, Styles. Uh, he would have combated Tyson's aggressiveness with making it reckless aggression where the uppercut would have found him. Uh, I also think, uh, you know, the jab would have stopped him in his place. Uh, and I think that uh, at the end of the day, Foreman adds to his KO ratio, which is one of the highest of all heavyweight champs of all time. Interesting. Well, you mentioned Frazier there. Let's talk about the next matchup is uh, Mike Tyson and Joe Frazier. Okay. Get ready to be happy. <laughs> okay? To know that uh, it is based on what I believe. It is based on what I believe here. Not here or anywhere else other than here and my experience, my judgments, where I believe they should count and matter. Uh, what both guys can and can't do. I think it's based on that. I think it would be it'd be a hell of a fun one. It would sell out. You know, they would all sell out these ones. But, I mean, those tickets would go fast to see these two guys, these two offensive dynamos, you know, offensive dynamos coming at each other. And... uh no backing down for the most part, you know, all aggression. Boy, oh boy, they could build this one. Boy, oh boy, they could sell this one. Boy, oh boy, it would get good numbers. I get excited thinking about it. It would be great to watch. Joe Frazier with his great left hook, you know, that crippling left hook, amazing left hook, body and head coming in there. But guess what? Frazier was all left hook. That's where the difference Tyson was left hook and right hand. And Joe Frazier's left hook could be a little fat sometimes. A little bit. Tyson had great timing. Tyson had good technique. Tremendous technique sometimes. And he had a great right hand too. And that right hand could have gotten inside one of those left hooks. Yeah. Tyson could... Frazier could hurt Tyson. But Tyson could hurt Frazier. I think Tyson... This might stun a few of you guys out there. And get you giddy and happy. Oh, oh, I'm so happy he said that. But I think that I think maybe Tyson might have even had a better chin. I mean, because the trim department. I mean, Frazier had a hell of a chin, hell of a chin, hell of a chin. But Tyson was right there. Tyson had a chin. He, yeah, he got stopped, but a lot of it was submission. He he had a he he had a 19, 20 inch neck. That's the shock absorber. Mm. He he had a good chin, and he would have been able to handle, I think, uh, if he got hit one of those left hooks, but uh, not too many of them. Nobody could, but he could have handled one of them. But I think the difference would be that Tyson was faster. Tyson was better technically. Yeah, Frazier was bobbing and weaving, but Tyson was slipping and sliding and bobbing and weaving and slipping and... Tyson was better in those areas of creating holes. Frazier created holes in one way for the left hook. Tyson could create holes for right hands, for left hooks, for left uppercuts, for right uppercuts, for jabs, you know? So I'm taking nothing away from Frazier. I love Joe Frazier. Taking nothing away from... Now I'm going to get the other people. Can you imagine you can't make people happy? <laughs> Ken, you can't win in this business. Did you learn that yet? <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. You know? The, I'm the, learning. Yeah, you are. The, the Tyson people, they hate me. Uh, and then now I'm saying something good about Tyson. The Frazier people are going to hate me. <laughs> I mean, how messed up is that? 
Well, you, but, you don't strike me as someone that needs to be loved as much as respected. So at the, the end of the wins. day, thank you. At the end of the day, the speed, the power of Tyson, both hands, Mickey Mantle, either side of the plate, right hand inside a wide left hook, you know, speed, combination, uh, diversity, because not just the one-dimensional left hooks. Uh, Joe Frazier was great. I'll say it again. And involved in one of the greatest fights of all time, the fight of the century, the real original fight of the century. Um, well, I don't know if it's the original. It's the original as far as being entitled that. But because to me, the first fight of the century, the greatest fight of significance will always be Max Schmeling and Joe Lewis, the second one, after Lewis was champion and he only loss was when he had been knocked out two years earlier, whatever it was, to Max Schmeling. And Lewis said, I'll never be champ till I beat Schmeling. And it was on the eve of World War II and everything going on and so much pressure. You talk about pressure. These kids nowadays talk about pressure. Before, go, before go we keep going John on Lewis. this mythical matchup, can we just talk about that one for a minute? Because I've heard you've, I've heard you've t talk about this fight before. And to me, this this fight is 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 so much Ken, bigger than just, a boxing match. It's unbelievable. It's it like, was the world. It was life. I mean, it was freedom, liberty, justice, and freedom for all. I mean, it was all of that. Everything, race, I, it was, race, everything. I mean, it, you know, it was on the. It had the shadow of Hitler hanging over the world, saying that you know he had the supreme race that that they were going to take over the world. And he was. And, and For a while, were, he they were, was. They were heading that direction. And, you know, and then you got our great army, our great armed service men and women who we could never thank enough doing what they did. And that all going on. And life still going on here in this country. And Joe Lewis is world champ. And boxing is probably the biggest sport in the country, that and baseball. And it stood for something, you know, it's, because on the eve of all this and with the Olympics, with Hitler at the Olympics and saying that he had the, again, the, the master race and all this garbage that uh, they're going to take over and for symbolism to the point that, you know, people that can't fight, that can't go out there and do the special things that the armed servicemen and women did, they can't go out there and carry a gun, they can't go out there and fly a ship uh, and and steer a ship or, you know, work on a ship or fly a, you know, a fighter pilot jet and risk themselves to keep this country free. They can't do those things, but they can do what they do. They can raise a family here, but they can support this country here. They can help this country continue to be what it is and to be together as a, as a unit, as a country as a family, and those people need belief. Those people need, you know, as the armed service people do, they, they all need a symbol. They all need something to show them that, you know, everything's going to be okay. You have your own belief, you know, and you have the President of the United States telling you we have to do this, we have to fight this fight, and you have special people in this country that fought this fight in their own ways, as I just described. Everyone in their own ways, supporting, sending, buying bonds, and, and supporting, and volunteering, and the whole country came together to make sure that this scourge did not come and destroy this country and destroy the world. And then in the midst of all this, with all this going on, you still got everyday stuff going on. You still got sports. And you have a boxing match. And everybody's watching. Hitler's watching. Hitler's got his guys, you know, saying it's his guy. Schmeling, that's representing them. And Joe Lewis representing, not us, the rest of the free world. Yeah. All of us. Not just here. And they're getting in the ring. Outdoors. You know, at Yankee Stadium. And it's on the radio. If you walk down the streets in New York during those times, you'd hear it. And Lewis comes out with a left hook to smell. I mean, it was on the radio. We didn't have everything that we have today with, you know, television stuff all over the place and 
pay per view and everything else. Gives you me know. goosebumps thinking about it now. And, and, like, and you could walk down the streets and you could hear the the the, the speakers blasting out this, you know, the calling of this fight. It's almost like the whole world stopped to watch. Stop to watch fight and and fight for what supremacy of the world. Mm-hmm. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's better? Who's worse? God Imagine Almighty! The pressure. And and the president, you don't know if it's a legendary story, but you know he called him. But the legendary story is that the president of the United States of America called Lewis before that fight and said, "Joe, you got to win this one for the good guys." You talk about pressure. <laughs> you talk about pressure, really, really. Yeah, Think I'll, about the people. Uh, sometimes I you say, imagine. "I hate to knock anyone," but you sometimes the people what they complain about now. Oh, I got too much. From uh, uh, maybe you should rethink that just and think about what you're grateful for and that that privilege that pressure truly is a privilege because it means that there's a reason to give you expectation <laughs> that that you have expectation to because it it can lead to helping you and other people and something special to it it's that there's a privilege to that I know it's it's heavy sometimes. It's a responsibility and all that. I know it, but it's a privilege to have that. Think yeah. about if you didn't have a responsibility. Well, how empty would that be? How scary would that be? Think about it sometimes. Think about it sometimes. What you think is hard is not hard. It's the opposite sometimes. What you think is easy is hard. That can be hard. That can be a life sentence. That can be misery. That can be despair. And... Joe Lewis, you know, had been knocked out by this guy two years earlier. I believe that was the time frame. And it's his only loss. And in front of the world, he's got to go out there. And Sperling's a hell of a fighter. Hell of a fighter. Mm. And he's got to go out there with his trainer, Jackie Blackburn. Great, great trainer. Great trainer. Really had a lot to do with Lewis being as good as he was. And not always the case. But in this case, it was. And great fighter himself. Jackie Blackburn, and they gotta they gotta go out there outdoors in Yankee Stadium with again with Hitler's war machine moving across Poland, moving across Europe, eating up com- countries like locusts, eating up crops, and they gotta go out there and get this done. And he goes out there and destroys the guy in one round. I mean. I remember watching some of the old clips, you know, like Cussus and stuff. And like I said, you could hear the radio commentary and the backdrop. Uh, it puts chills up your spine. You know? I get chills thinking about it right now. <coughs> Imagine the, 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 not just the United States, but the whole like um, free world is trying to stop this. It doesn't even seem real when you, tell, when you think about it now. That there's one country just moving across, taking over other countries. The most significant sporting event, I think, in the history of our world. I know it's a big statement, but for me, it's the right statement. It's the true statement. It's the real statement. But Joe Lewis is special, and that's one of the reasons he's special. That I, I weigh all that stuff in. Mm-hmm. But I, uh, in that second mythical matchup, I would have had, you know, like I said, I it would have been, it would have been Mike Tyson. I think knocking out Joe Frazier, he would have too fast, too much power in both hands. The right hand inside left hooks, uh, good enough chin to hold up if it had to hold up to one of those left hooks. And uh, fighting fire with fire, Frazier was all brim and fire, brimstone and fire. But fighting fire with fire, but Tyson's fire was a little hotter. It was a little hotter, you know, and Tyson was one of the great finishers. There's different reasons for it. We'll get into that some other time. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was a great finisher. He, Joe Lewis was the greatest finisher of heavyweights, I think, of all time. He got you hurt. Good night. <laughs> but um, Tyson was a damn good finisher. Jack Dempsey was a damn good finisher too. But I think Tyson would have hurt him. And when he hurt him, I think uh, he knew what he had in front of him. Part of the reason why Tyson was a great finisher was because of his fear. Because... He knew because that fear can be helpful too. And it was helpful to him in that way that he wanted to get rid of something that he feared, mm-hmm. something he knew could hurt him. Made sense. Yeah. You know, and uh, he would take advantage of that moment. 
to do that. Mm-hmm. So now we got one more, I think, going with Tyson. Yep. Speaking of. So it's uh, one on one now, you guys, of, right? You happy? One on one. Now, which way is it going to go? Let's take a vote. Let's <laughs> see how smart you guys are. And here's the last one that you talked about the, of the great intimidators, Sonny Liston. Mike Tyson, Sonny Liston. Sonny what Liston, happens? yep. One of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Again, he's never going to get his due. He will here, though. I'm not saying he was the greatest person. I'm not going to say it was all his fault. But at the end of the day, decision you make, they're your decisions. And that's that. But he had a tough life. You know, we talk about Tyson's tough life. A lot of people had tough life. Sonny Liston had a tough life. Tough life. And uh, he got in situations and it it has left a cloud over his career. We don't know what happened. We don't know if he really overdosed, if he if he was hit with a hot shot. If he, We know he was afraid of needles. And meanwhile, supposedly he was putting something in his arm, a chunk in his arm. That did make sense to people that knew him. Uh, we know he was around a lot of uh, a lot of difficult people, so we don't know. There's a lot of questions, and that's why he wasn't loved the way Ali was loved to a certain extent, and never got that love, and never got that. And of course, he lost the fight to Ali, you know, and that's what allowed Ali to start that on his passageway to greatness. But we don't know if those fights were fixed either. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know for sure, but what we do know, that's what we're here to talk about, what we do know. This is what we do know. He had one of the greatest jabs of all time, if not the greatest. Yep. Oh, Ali had the greatest jab. Oh, Larry Holmes had the greatest jab. Oh, this one had the greatest jab. I'm telling you, Sonny Liston had maybe the greatest jab of all. It was hard. It was a phone call. Uh, it was, and it was weird. It was a freak of nature. It would come to here, Ken, right? I've watched them. you got to remember, I watched all these tapes. I yeah. had the privilege. It would come to here, and it, it would go there. It was like like his shoulder had another movement, another joint to go to, <laughs> another six inches. It was the weirdest thing. And and all would... Almost like a double clutch. Yeah. And, and it, was, it would just go longer than it was supposed to go. Or intended to go. Like his shoulder all of a sudden would expand itself to allow it to go another six inches. Yeah. And he, you know, I I guess I really, the sport, you know, I notice things that, you know, you'd only notice if you really cared about the sport. Mm -hmm. And and I remember watching film and I saw that and I talked to Cus about it. And, he had power with it. It was straight. It was hard. I mean, it was like somebody else's right hand. It could it could pulverize you. I mean, it was it was so hard. And I mean, get a look at it here. That's my man. Wow, look at that. That's that's Rob coming up with this good footage. Sonny's on the left. Here. Actually, that's one of the uh, that's one of the old cl- tapes that you were actually watching up there from yeah, the uh, ESPN yeah. Classics. Hey, look at that jab. Can we freeze that? Because I think it shows what I'm talking about. Look at that. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, really, that's yeah. fabulous. That is fabulous. That that Rob would just jump on that. I, you know, I forget that this 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 magic exists. You know that yeah. this theater of of the unknown, the theater of, of the wonderful kingdom of magic, the internet. You've heard about this thing, <laughs> yeah. right, Ken? We probably would have more of, of this if you hadn't like jammed up some of the clips up there. Well, I, 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 let's not get into that. But yeah, I, <laughs> I, I lost part of his arm. But I, I mean, you see that jab? Do you see how long it was? You know what I noticed when he throws it? He almost turns his entire body sideways to get the, as full of extension as he can see, get, like a swimmer wanting to get a full stroke and rotate That's their the entire body. You're so right, Ken. And and it was it was I think it was it might have been the greatest jab ever. And I'm just gonna tell you that Sonny Liston was a great puncher. He could punch with either hand, like Tyson. Well it's a lot of guys, like I said, there were guys like Shavers, they could punch with the right hand, Wilder now with the right hand, Max Bear with the right hand, you know, Joe Frazier with the left hook I said, but not both. 
Mm, and Tyson had both, point. but so did so did Liston. He could punch, and he knew how to fight. He had technique. He knew how to fight, and he he had balance. His legs were always in position. They were always under him. He was he was always set. He had good hand speed. He could go body, go to the head. Oh my God, he was good. He was good. He was so good, but he was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what took away from him, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, f- I feel bad. I'm not afraid to say that. I feel bad that he doesn't get his proper due, and that's, I guess that's what I want to do is give him his proper due because I think he should. And he, because you can't hide from things that are things, and these things I'm saying are there, that are true. He, and he had a great chin. I mean, he had everything. Again, did he, did someone get to him in those alley fights? We don't know. But at the end of the day, him fighting Tyson, he could match Tyson's power, his technique. He was the bigger guy. He was the not even though he came from an earlier era, he was the naturally bigger guy, longer guy. I think he could. I think what F- Foreman did to Tyson in my mythical matchup of catching him with that uppercut, right, and what he did to Frazier, I think that Liston would do that to Tyson with his jab. I think it would be like that cartoon, The Roadrunner. Beep, 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 beep. And the coyote was chasing the the bird, the roadrunner, and the coyote's chasing it, and the beep, 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 and running down the (laughs) the train track, running, 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 and then all of a sudden, bang, the train hits the coyote and the coyote's flat on the front of the train <laughs> <laughs> going the other way. Remember that? Yeah, of course. Right? I, we'll see how good Rob is if he comes up with this. <laughs> then then I bow. Those cartoons, I do, might, but, those cartoons then, might be a little ahead I, of Rob's I don't times. bow to anybody. I don't bow. But I, I'm not going to bow. We don't <laughs> bow. There's no bowing here. There's no bowing. But then I will genuflect or something. I, I salute uh, I my, salute. You uh, give him a curtsy. You I, love sal- the I salute Don Corleone. <laughs> I salute. But that seems more appropriate. Yeah, that would be a little bit more appropriate, much more appropriate. So that would be what would happen with Tyson with the jab of Foreman. Tyson would be at the end of that jab like the coyote on 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 that locomotive, flat, mm-hmm. pulverized, bang. That jab would have hit him. It would have sent a message, a physical and a mental message. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the naturally bigger guy in a lot of ways. And he would have went. He was a tremendous body puncher, listen. And he would have went to that body with that power. Everything he threw was hard. Mm. Talk about throwing with bad intentions with hard everything drew was hard so he would have went to that body with nothing but hard shots and that body attack from Liston would have taken away and stymied and eliminated some of the head movement of Tyson the elusive ability to move because when he got hit in the body his body wouldn't move so much Mm. anymore you know what I mean so it would slow down that head movement which would make him a sitting duck and then the other punches the left hook the the punches like that destroyed so that destroyed a comrade, uh, a stablemate of Tyson years earlier, Floyd Patterson, mm-hmm. who was brought up by Cus, by Tyson's mentor Cus, my mentor, mm-hmm. Cus the model. You know, Liston would have wound up being the nemesis of two of Cus's fighters, <laughs> Floyd Patterson and Tyson. If Ty- I'll tell you one thing. To, uh, you would never know it because he's not here but I believe that if Cuz was around he never would have let Tyson fight Liston he didn't want him to fight he didn't want Patterson to fight Liston Cuz didn't want that fight oh, he didn't okay. want that fight no and he wouldn't have wanted this fight for Tyson because he would have known what I know what we're talking about here that with either hand with the power with the body work the jab the mental the final part the coupe de grace, the mental part, the intimidation. If Tyson was intimidated by Foreman, I think he would have been because Foreman was a better intimidated than Tyson. And 
I think that he might have, again, now nah, you're not going to like this. <laughs> Tyson might have needed a diaper <laughs> to get in the ring. Now he's never going to come on the show, Teddy. Nah, he might have <laughs> needed a diaper. I, I'm, uh, I'm just being figurative. I'm, I'm just saying that to make a point, to get in the ring with this man because he would have intimidated Tyson. I think we made a case that Tyson could be intimidated. He wouldn't. He would show it in different ways by yeah. his action, not uh, in different ways. He was intimidated by the manliness of Holyfield by biting his ear off. Mm -hmm. That's why he bit his ear off. He was too much man for him. It was so he, he was intimidated. I think right? where he even showed more intimidation was against Lennox Lewis in the build-up yes. to that. That time. Well, that's that why he infamous, attacked him. Well, the infamous <clears throat> that's a good point. after the attack. Forget the attack. That, but why do you think he attacked him at the press conference? God, he was because he was intimidated. And that Lennox Lewis is a big, big guy. He was scared. And he, he was and, trying and, to... He and was Lennox trying Lewis to... didn't appear to be intimidated at all. No, he wasn't. But what really highlighted it for me was that it just insane... And I've been a fan of Mike Tyson, and I, I... But that insane rant that he went on against someone in the audience, like, there's always going to be people chirping at you in the audience, but his response to that was so unhinged and off the rails, that's when... It became clear to me that like it was almost like the beginning of the end where people weren't scared anymore. Even the reporters were heckling him. You know, it was kind of like the the mask was off at that point. Yeah, and that seemed to yeah, be the, like a the, sharp decline from there. The wizard, the the curtain was yeah pulled back. But uh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, but he would have everything. It would have been his worst nightmare because everything he had, the other guy had more. Yeah, he had power. The other guy had power, maybe more. He could punch with either hand. The other guy could punch with either hand. He knew how to fight. He had good technique. The other guy knew how to fight. He had good technique. The other guy was longer, bigger. The other guy didn't seem to be intimidated. Tyson had a good jab. He did have a good jab. Mm -hmm. The other guy had a better jab. Tyson liked to intimidate guys. This guy did intimidate guys. He made a living out of it. Mm -hmm. He did it naturally. <laughs> Tyson did it by copying somebody. Yeah. The original is always better. <laughs> and at the end of the day, guys that live that kind of life, they can smell. They can sniff it out. The guys that are real and the guys that aren't real. Liston would have sniffed them out. He would have sniffed them out. And he would have known what he had. And Tyson would have known what he had. At the end of the day, oh, do I have to add this part in? Should I? Shouldn't I? <laughs> Diaper gets changed and Tyson gets knocked out. Uh, he gets knocked out in the fight. He he He's in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong man. But he does knock out Joe Frazier, maybe in two or three rounds. I had to give you something. <laughs> I think they'd be really, I think they'd be really good fights to watch, especially oh, yeah. that Frazier. I mean, all of them, Foreman and Tyson would be so interesting. Uh, but that Frazier and Tyson, that would have been, boy, oh boy, that would have been like being involved in a great snowball fight. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about all these great fighters and all these like the history involved with the heavyweight division. When you're alone, do you ever think like, holy shit, I helped win the heavyweight title with Michael Mora? Does it look like, do you ever let yourself think like, man, I did it? I was lucky enough to have Perfecto win the heavyweight title too. Of course, but I'm just talking yeah, about Michael because yeah. it was the first one. Yeah, no, you're right. No, Mora was special. Not only did we win it, though, as long as you brought it up, we won it twice mm -hmm. with Mora. So very special. We won it, we lost to one of the great heavyweights of all time, Mr. Foreman. I think a great person. I yeah. happen to be a big fan of George's. And um and so we we lost it to him and then we come back and we we come back and we uh we win it again in a foreign country mm -hmm. on the other guy's turf and on ABC Wild World of Sports. But as you as we're talking about this, does it do, do, you, do you have moments of reflection like when cuz when you're talking about all these greats I'm like No, Man. you're right. I take it for granted and I don't mean to. And I don't mean to but we try to tell what we tell uh right off the cuff. 
and uh, I I don't think of it uh, in that kind of in that kind of way, you know, historic sort of perspective. I don't think of it really. And then when you bring it up, maybe I think about it now a minute, but I don't think of it that way. I just think of it was a time we were there and we did what we did and it was a moment in our time and a moment in our lives. There was a big moment, an important moment for my family, for his family, for all of us, that we bonded together to get something done, something special done, you know. But I don't think of it beyond those terms into maybe now you're talking about this and this overall context of everything, you know. Heavyweight title is a pretty good thing. Not bad. When I it, it it's never lost on me when I see like Alex Vosdick with the WBC belt. It sounds crazy. Every time I see it, I get chills. I'm like, man, this represents so much. Or if I see someone with a Stanley Cup ring or a World Series ring, I'm just like, and 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 it look, does with, mean so much. When things happen to to you, it might not. It's easy, like you said, to take it for granted or not. Appreciate I don't mean that gravity. the wrong way, but I'm trying to be completely mean. honest. Um, I don't mean it that it's not taken for granted. I know how privileged, I know how graced I am, uh, how blessed I am. Oh, my God, how fortunate I am, how lucky I am. And I'm so, so grateful. But it it, you, it happened and you, you're not thinking about it. It's the wrong way to say it for granted, but you, you're not thinking about it all the time in those terms. Yeah. What's the significance of that? Yeah, I know I know what you mean. I just hopefully you have some moments now that the dust has settled as we reflect on these other great champions to just I ain't dead yet. <laughs> just appreciate how awesome of an achievement it is. All the all the different world titles and I know you've had a lot of them, but just made me think about as we're talking about all these great heavyweights that at one point you were part of a team that captured the heavyweight world title and it's awesome. Thank you. And that's a good place to leave off here. And we'll be back with some of the myst- mythical matchups that we um, discussed in the, in the uh, beginning of the show. And can our fans show. there, without you guys, we, we, no reason to do this, can they somehow tell us which ones they like to? We're going to do Absolutely. the ones we're doing. We're locked yep. into those. Yep. And I hope I picked the right ones, and I hope you enjoy them. I really do. And I tried to pick the right ones for the right reasons uh, that I said earlier, that everybody could kind of embrace and put their mind around. Um but if you have some thoughts on them, right? Absolutely. Uh, Kenny reads everything. <laughs> Don't tell him that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do. So when you shit talking me, I'm reading those. Stop it. Oh, God almighty. It's always the person, though, with an anonymous name and not a picture. I know. It's cut. Cut. <laughs> Bye. Love you. Thanks for being with us. Keep the comments coming. Appreciate you. We'll be back soon.